Hi, Lenise. Hello, Hamish. Um, I thought a good way to kind of get into some of your techniques would be to talk about your approach to recordings and instruments and kind of how they've changed over time. Maybe if we start with the drums, what have been some of your favorite techniques and how they changed over the years? Well, um, you know, what? It, what's really that makes the difference, Hamish, is not so much... Uh, how the technique has changed. It depends on the music and, and how I want the drums to sound for that particular style of music or song or the signature sound of the um, band. Um, depends on how I decide to mic the drums. It's, it's not so much that uh, the style of music has, has uh, changed in that respect. Um, for example, um, working with a group like Blondie um, that uh, Clem Burke, the drummer, had a very loud, bombastic drum style, still does. Um, I used a certain technique on him that included lots of room mics, like a... Um, what we did for his snare was uh, we had a KM84 on the snare and then had one straight up about six feet above the snare and then another one on a really high boom about, um, I don't know, 12 feet above kind of straight up very very much straight up you know looked up and and made sure that they were in alignment um using room mics not using room mics uh, closer miking um uh, sometimes i used the i mic all the drums um and sometimes i don't use the tom mics because the sound being picked up in the overheads is a uh, is a fuller, richer sound than perhaps using the attack of the close miking. So it just depends more on the sound as opposed to uh, a time frame, like from earlier on until now. Um, and I'm always experimenting as well to try different things, just to see you know, what picks up um, a bigger bass, you know, bass drum sound, um, if that's necessary, but sometimes it's not. Have, you know, people say, well, what's your favorite mic or what's, you know, your favorite gear? Um, but as far as the drums go, if it's a jazzier sound, I, I use a brighter overheads, like, uh, you know, um, AKG 451s, I'll have those. Um, if it's uh, more of a rock thing, I'll use 87s. If it's, uh, um, it just depends on what I'm going for. Um, and, and also it depends on what the studio has where I'm recording. If they don't have those things, I, I use what the studio has. And um, and I I like to ask my assistant if I'm in a studio that I haven't worked in before. Um, besides knowing what I, I my go to mics or you know just to um, you know the tried and true, I always like to ask my assistant what somebody you've been working with using for you know. Um, overheads or hi-hat or snare or or toms or whatever that would be different than what I'm using just because um, the assistants in the studio are a great resource because they work with different people every day and as an engineer myself I'm not in the studio every day I'm not doing a big tracking date every day um, so I like to know what uh, other people are using and try them out and see what I think. Do you have any favorite studios, particularly these days, that you like to work out of the most? 
Well, I live in Los Angeles in the Hollywood area, so I'm very fortunate. <laughs> so <laughs> there, there's a whole bunch <laughs> here that are our favorites um, from uh, the big studios like the Village Recorder or Village Studios. That's what it's called now. Um, to uh, East West, which is wonderful. Conway is wonderful. Um, down to a, there's a wonderful smaller studio that I love called New Monkey, and it used to be Elliot Smith's studio, and it was an older jazz studio, and it's it's got this lovely sound to it and a Trident uh, A uh, A series and uh, tri Trident A range. And great outboard gear, and um, you know, um, wonderful sound to it. So there, there are so many. We are so blessed to have still so many around in this city. I enjoyed working at Air too. I got to work at Air on Oxford Street many long years ago, and that was fun. But. Uh, Clearly, that's not one of my current favorites. <laughs> Have you um, worked much out of United West and Ocean Way since you left there? Um, well, no, because I went into post-production. Um, I took a little break. I, I I took a little cancer break for um, about eight years. And, uh, and then when I came back, I went into post-production instead of making music and that was a fair amount of time that I wasn't making music in music studios um, but when I came back it was then East West and yeah I've worked there a few times and another cool place is uh, the Evergreen Stage it was Barbara Streisand's studio and big scoring stage, wonderful sound. I did about four projects there last year and um, really like the sound there. Did you have any favorite rooms at United Western? <laughs> yes. Um, one, two, and three. Yeah. <laughs> All of them for different things. I, um, I spent the majority of my time in three, of course, um, where we did uh, lots of overdubs and vocals and mixed. Um, when we would cut the basic tracks, meaning drums, bass, guitar, uh, keyboards, work vocal, whatever, um, back then um, when I was working there a lot, uh, over at what is now back to United. It was United then. It went to Ocean Way and now it's back to United. But um, in in their main studio there is where, because I could get that big drum sound I wanted. And so we'd cut the tracks there and then do all the overdubs and um, mixing in Studio 3 at uh, Western, East West, and then Studio 1, was is a great room for any orchestration, which that's where I'd go for that. And uh, Studio Two is just a wonderful sounding room. They're all just fantastic. Uh, Bill Putnam, any Bill Putnam room, in my experience, is always just sounding wonderful and controllable as far as what you're looking for. Were there any particular recording techniques or philosophies that you learned there that kind of stuck with you throughout the rest of your recording? Yes, there's a lot of experimentation. Um, I was fortunate to have that luxury because we, uh, Mike Chapman, who was the producer I worked for at the time when I was there, um, four-walled it. You know, he just booked it as his for years. <laughs> so even after I left, he still had it for some time. And uh, so it was ours. We could do whatever we wanted. And he was very, uh, he depended on me actually to be creative and, and 
try different things or what worked for um, different artists or bands. Um, for example, one technique that uh, I used for more rock female singers is uh, I found that their dynamics were so great in anywhere like from a T 10 dB change between verse and chorus or when they would be singing low and then they'd go and screaming something. Um, quite often I just gave them a um, 57, sure 57 to hold and then I would have a an 87 about three feet away from them up above them and um, that uh, had a lot of gain to it and I would run it through um, my favorite limiter for um, for a vocal chain that I found worked really well for especially working fast was a DBX 160. It, uh, it wasn't very very expensive limiter but uh, it seemed to work really well on female vocals and um, in the sense that dynamically you didn't it could really hit hit it hard and you wouldn't hear it pumping or you wouldn't hear it kicking in so much. And uh, I really love that to capture performances. I don't like to take much time while somebody's in the moment and they're ready to sing and they're feeling it. And, you know, I'm going to inspire and capture a performance. I don't want to labor over something. And um, if it's my responsibility to be able to do that technically when they're out there doing their thing. And quite often it's the first take. Do you mostly like to process on the way in? Um, not much. Only a little bit of limiting again. Well, for, for vocals, yeah. To um, First of all, uh, before... We actually get into it um, if it's a, well, whatever the situation is. I like to do a shootout between microphones to find out what is the best sounding microphone for that voice. And I'll be able to t have a few educated choices going, I think, because of what their voice sounds like. This particular mic will work or this one, but I'm going to try this one. And then again, I'll ask the assistant. What? What's a cool vocal mic somebody's been using that I don't really have up there that you think would be cool to try? And we'll put that one up, whatever that is. And then I have the artist sing the same thing four times. And then we do a blind listening test. And um, they come into the control room and we listen. And, and uh, it's pretty it's often pretty clear which one would work best on their voice and um and then we go with that and then again for the dynamics i just like to um uh, it's not so much compression for me because um i'm also thinking down the line what will happen in mixing and what will happen in mastering and there's compression all along there or you can Use that there. I just don't want to, if I'm going analog, I certainly don't want to saturate the tape. And if I'm uh, going digitally, I, you know, I don't want to overshoot it there as well. And uh, and then I'm also mixing as as uh, as we record. Um, I'm writing the the fader because. I already know that the, when they get to the chorus, it's going to be hotter. So I already know to bring it down a little bit so I don't hit the limiter that hard. So there's you know, air and dynamics, and it sounds rich and full. When you are mixing, how do you decide between processing on individual tracks or general buses or the two bus at the end? Um, I usually don't like to... Um, um, do anything to the stereo bus uh, because again I'm 
I'm going to master and I want the mastering engineer to be able to <laughs> have something to deal with. If there's already compression on it, what are they supposed to do? You know, compress it again. Um, and so it's very important to be mindful of, of what you want your mastering engineer to do. And, um, so I always keep them in mind. And then if there's airplay, there's, there's, you know, um, three stage compression coming through the, um, you know, the medium of broadcast. And so you got to remember that too. Um, so when I'm mixing, um, as far as processing goes, um, well, for one thing, I'm, I'm go along with the Al Schmidt school of, of recording. I, I try to get the sound or my goal is to get the sound in the room with the microphone in the right place in front of the right piece of equipment, um, or the vocalist or, um, uh, to get it while I'm recording it and, or, so I don't use uh, any EQ or very, very little. I want, if it doesn't sound right coming through uh, the console or, um, or even in the box, uh, I, move, I change the mic, I move the mic, I have the artist move back, I have, you know, whatever. I, I want to capture the sound right then without manipulating it, if possible. Now, if there's a time crunch and whatever, but uh, you know, then you know I, I add a little EQ. But in mixing, so that's when I want to add a little EQ is in mixing. It's like maybe I want to, you know, a little brighter here or roll off some of the bass there. I often do a bass roll off, um, depending on what it is while I'm recording. Um, just so it, the bottom doesn't just get all muddy and thumpy and stepping on other things, you know, cancellation, etc. If you're trying to be minimal with processing, are mic preamps then quite important to you? Yes. Yes. A mic it's a, a good preamp. Um it's a sound. I'm again the style of music that um I'm I f feel comfortable with is um real people playing real instruments and real singers really singing. So, um, if I'm doing a band, we've been rehearsing. I rehearse a band, I rehearse, I, there's pre-production. So when we go into the studio, um, we optimize our, our time and our budget in there. That's my job as a producer is to make sure the budget that we have, I, I utilize to its best advantage. And um, so I already know what they sound like and I already know what I, I want them to sound like. So when I go in the control room, it better sound like that. Or if it doesn't, then <laughs> that's something we're going to change something. Um, but knowing what the, what the sound is, knowing what you're going for, having a vision and, and going for it is is uh, extremely important. Just like you might shoot out mics, do you ever shoot out different preamps? Um, good question. If, I wouldn't call it so much as a shootout. Because I, um, again, it depends on what the studio has, um, but also, uh, yeah, I'll try, yes, I wouldn't do a deliberate, I haven't done deliberate shootouts, but I've tried various ones and saying, oh, I like what that sounds like on that, or, you know, um, and I like to mix it up a little bit. It's like it's these. Um, I I feel that the 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 gear and the studio and the console and the monitors and the microphones and 
all of that. Those are the instruments that I play, and those are, that's the palette that I paint with. And um, so I like to add different colors, uh, either knowingly what that preamp is going to sound like or, you know, start out with that, go, oh, yeah, there's a sound. Or if it's not sounding like that, I'll try something else or I'll say, what do you have? What else do you have here? You know, I'll be asking the assistant. Because um, I don't have my own studio. I I have a, I can do overdubs and, and I can, um, you know, comp and do production work and all of that. In in my home, I have a setup, a Pro Tools setup. Um, and I use that and for smaller things and, and working out things here. But um, my happy place is, is in a, a sound palace, if possible. And I encourage everybody to have that experience to because this is this is art that we're creating. Um, I'm not somebody who just, you know, gets a preset on a plug-in and, and runs with it. I'm, I want to know why I'm – to be – I want to be confident in why I'm, I've got the setup that I have, the um, audio manipulation that I'm using. Whatever I'm doing, it's because <laughs> it's deliberate. It's not like, well, somebody else used this and, and – so I'm going to use it too, and and does it sound any good? Well, you know, they used it. I'm I'm not like that. <laughs> when you're recording whole bands, do you generally generally like to do it? Um, kind of do whole takes and just keep the drums, or do you try and do it as live as possible? Well, the goal, um, ideally, <laughs> the the ultimate goal would be if everybody nailed it it's together because there's a vibe that is picked up but uh, but you're right if nothing else the drums have to be happening and you can very, pretty much replace everything else uh, but I, I to me that's um, I would prefer to have the energy and the um, vibe that happened when they were all playing together and, and playing off each other and, and digging it, you know, and having fun and, and ca I want to capture that, that moment. And so hopefully the, you know, the, the rhythm guitars or, or whatever the instrumentation is, you know, if, I, I like to have everybody in the room, even though I try to have any amps or, um, if it's a Hammond B3, the Leslie isolated, anything isolated, so the the players can be in the room, and um, so they that energy is there, and um, and then the vocalist sometimes is in the room, and um, sometimes it's in a vocal booth, but there's definitely eye contact and communication. The headphone mix is absolutely essential to um, to capturing a good uh, recording, a good take. And really good communication is essential as well. They have to be able to hear me in the control room, and uh, I have to be able to communicate well with them so they know what's going on, so they're not just standing out there and people in the control room are talking about what they're doing out there and they're just standing there wondering what's going on. The communication between the control room and the, and the artist is essential. And also if the headphone mix is good, then uh, they'll stop thinking about their, what they sound like in their phones and they'll just perform. That's why I always um, find it, economical to work in a room that has um, individual headphone mix boxes systems um, because that way the musician can get the mix that they're comfortable with and then we can all go together you know the piano player wants more piano the vocalist wants more vocal obviously the and 
drums are everywhere and you know more bass every everybody wants their own individual mix so they're comfortable so they're playing well together not thinking about their headphones have you ever noticed any differences between how people play with doing their own headphone mixes and all having the same one um interestingly enough it's been a long time since i've had that situation because it's a it just takes up too much time and energy trying to make everybody happy with one headphone mix i mean you should uh, so no i <laughs> no i don't know how to compare that because i choose not to do it that way if if anything else i make sure that the drummer has a separate cue system than the the band or everybody else because he needs to hear differently. And he can already hear his drums like crazy. He needs to hear everybody else. Um, or to fit, just that if there was nothing else and I had to go through a cue system on a console, um, then that's what it'd be. But I find it saves so much time and therefore money. Pardon me. If, um, if they can create their own mix get one set up for them and get a basic one set up and then they can adjust it themselves. Um, that saves money. Even those studios that have those typically charge a little bit more sometimes because of that money well spent. I wanted to ask um, about when you work with Steely Dan, it's obviously they're kind of, notorious for being very <laughs> meticulous in the studio yeah was there anything notably different on those sessions to other sessions that you worked on yes well they were very uh, mind you this was before digital so i suspect that if they could have recorded digitally and punch and you know been able to move things around or whatever things may have been a little bit different um However, um, that didn't exist, so my experience with them was um, they could be so meticulous, uh, punching in even note by note of overdubbing a bass player. They would record basic tracks. They would get a basic track down, and again, like you said, uh, if, not, if they didn't keep anything else, they at least kept the um, the drums, and that's what the whole thing was for. Um, sometimes they kept some of the um, actual performances that were done during the tracking day, <laughs> but not so often. Um, it was just understood that they everything would be redone and quite often by somebody else other than who they had paid good money for in the tracking date or it just depended they again they had such specific visions that um you know tortured they tortured themselves because they knew donald knew what he wanted and um one of the things that was very difficult for him was to sing he did not like his voice at that time and he didn't want to sing but he didn't know anybody else who could sing it. He had to sing it and uh, because that was their sound. In fact, on one record, before I worked with him um, on Camp by a Thrill, they hired a singer, David Palmer, who sang one of their hits, I Don't Want to Do Your Dirty Work. And he had this really sweet musical voice and Donald sang backgrounds, but it was that didn't last because that wasn't really their sound. You know, it had to be Donald, and he just would be tortured while he sang. He was miserable. <laughs> Were they very specific about microphones and microphone techniques? About microphones and mic technique? Yes. Well, uh, oh gosh, Roger Nichols. He was. Uh, Roger the Immortal, sadly may rest in peace, was my main mentor of all the engineers that I worked with when I started out. I, I did the Asia album at the Village with him for ten and a half months, and um, 
uh, then worked on part of Gaucho. But uh, yes, very specific. Uh, Roger was a nuclear physicist as well. So um, he was a brilliant man and um, just nicest guy on the planet and so brilliant, yet he had the ability to explain things in such a way that everybody could understand this very technical concept. He was one of these smarty pants who tries to let you know how smart he is. You know, he, he really wanted to communicate. So, um, he, and he was so passionate about recording or just about anything he was interested in that he really made sure he, he communicated it in a way that everybody could understand and, and, and enjoy his passion for it. And as far as my techniques and, um, because he had worked with Steely Dan so long and knew their sound and actually was a big part of creating their sound that, yes, they were very specific microphones. And, um, and he taught me things, you know, the minutia of good recording and the science of it. For example, uh, use the shortest mic cable you can um, because that just, everything was about having the cleanest signal po possible and the signal flow. And he said, don't have microphones, mic, mic cables touching each other. Um, you know, things like that. People want to know what makes a Steely Dan record sound so great. It's all that stuff that everybody else says, ah, you're never going to hear that. Well, yes, you do. It all adds up. And um, to um, exemplary recording style. Um, he was... Uh, and it was a very simple chain. Donald sang into a U87 through an 1176. Boom. And I don't, uh, I don't think he EQ'd him, but I don't remember specifically. He was, it was just, uh, uh, there were a few times when he actually bypassed the console and went right into the tape machine to for no VCAs, no electronics that way. Can you remember any other examples of um, some of their favorite mics or very particular techniques that they use? <laughs> um, yes, on the, the overheads on the drums were um, often um, 450 winds with a 10 dB pad. Um, he used uh, a KM84 on the hi-hat coming from the side. Um, a lot of people put it right on top, but he liked to get the air of it when it opened and closed. So he didn't get, he didn't record it from the top. He recorded it from the side. So when it, they clamped together, there was a bit of psh, subtle, but again, the minutia that had that sound gave it the air. Um, I'm trying to remember, this was a long time ago, Hamish, <laughs> and I was so green. Um, you know, I was just learning, too, and so um, there are a lot of, and I worked with so many different engineers it's, um, who had s such distinct different styles in how they recorded things. So there are different microphones used. I don't I think he used a KM84 um, Roger on the snare too, but it d depended on the drummer. If it was Bernard Purdy, he would have, who had a different style. Um, I suspect he could have used a, a 57. 57s are great on snares. And uh, he, he, it wasn't a complicated setup at all. It was a clean setup. Minimalist setup. Do you remember what they normally would have used on guitar amps? 67. And, um, and, a, and a 57, quite often. It depended on the amp. Um, on the bass amp, I think he used uh, an SM7 as well as a, an... Uh, he liked 67s, and I like 67s. But they're very sensitive, you know, so um, 
not a lot of ribbon mics. Yeah, 87s, we used 87s a lot back then. Were there any particular things that um, affected whether you used an 87 or a 67? To choose a um, 87 or a 67? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, well, um, an 87 um, was is, is just a really good workhorse. Uh, it was, uh, from what my understanding, it was designed for broadcast. And um, uh, so it's, it's very good on vocals. It's a good all-around rich sounding, you know, large capsule. And um, where the 67 just had a kind of, I guess, a little warmer sound or a little, I don't know, a little more musical. I find I get a a tone myself with it that I like over an, an 87 that's a, you know, it's so hard to differentiate between those because it's so subjective Hamish it's it's what you know what somebody likes to hear whether it's you know there's no right or wrong um when somebody says what's what's the best mic for a vocal there is only one best mic for a vocal and you know which one that is whatever sounds best on the day that's right (laughs) that's the one that's the one you use, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's why it's so important to experiment and so important to, um, you know, there's new microphones coming out all the time, uh, emulating the sound of these older mics, a lot of them, but also a lot of them have their own unique sound to them. And um, it's exciting to try new mics and and... Um, just uh, the other ones yeah they're tried and true and it's great when you get a chance to use those and there is a definite difference but um, it's just what whatever you have the opportunity that's why it's so important that's why um, it's so important to learn your microphones being a good sound engineer is an acquired skill and you build your own toolbox for the way that you feel you record the best as a, as the engineer, and you don't learn that overnight to, or just from watching YouTube, um, you know, tutorials. Um, it's something that becomes a part of you and your intuition and your awareness is um, grow as you, the more you do it. And I encourage everybody who's starting out there to really learn your microphones, which ones do you like best and, and why? And um, try, you know, when, if you can just, practice using them if even if um you're not doing a session um you know uh if you have an opportunity to experience different microphones say at somebody else's place or you go i'm you know i want to compare these microphones on can you play your acoustic guitar and let me see what uh, this 121 sounds like or this you know I'm going to put a 414 on it or try the what different instruments sound with different microphones on them in different positions and what does it sound like in a, in a you know controlled environment with uh, baffles all around what does it sound like what does the room sound like um, they could you know the instrument sound with uh, room mics as well as close-up mics. Um, what would happen if I put this microphone underneath the piano instead of on top? What would that add? You know, experiment and uh, go out and listen and learn what instruments sound like, and then learn how to capture that authentically, and then also learn when how to make it sound a different way that uh, that's of your choice because you you have a choice you have a vision so um 
learn how to make those happen with the tools that you have to create that. Following on from that, I thought it might be good to finish up by talking about what first got you interested in recording studio work and how you kind of got started in the industry. Well, I got started, I started out studying film. uh, Well, I grew up in Los Angeles, so I was put to work at the age of eight in the Screen Children's Guild, which was a um, kind of a organization where they, if they needed kids on a shoot for a television show or a commercial or a movie or something, they, you know, we go to the specific agency and said, pick out the kids that they thought they wanted and you'd audition and then you'd be in the shoot. So I was put to work early in the industry and I loved it. And so I, um, wanted to go into film and television production. And then my boyfriend who had a band, uh, his guitar player was engineering at, um, a prominent musician artist's house named Leon Russell, who had a home studio back in the seventies. Yeah. He was, um, part of the wrecking crew as well as, a you know, major session player, but also a prominent singer, songwriter, performer, extreme talent on his own and very smart and innovative and had his own studio with a Stevens 40 track tape machine. Only three of them were made ever. And he had one and, um, I was invited over to check it out and I was a huge fan of Leon. So I went, sure. And I went over after school one day and, uh, was just blown away. The first time I heard the music coming through those monitors in this control room and seeing the tape machine and the gear and the console and everything. I just, boom, that was it. I, I said to Roger, show me how to work this. <laughs> and I dropped out of university the next day and found a recording school and signed up and told my parents. So went to a, a record to one of the few recording schools back in the day and um, uh, graduated and got a job at the village recorder. Now at the village studios where they hired, um, there were a total of four of women assistant engineers there and two male assistants, but four females. And, uh, so there was, and and one female tech. Uh, so there was major gender equality there as, as far as that went. And, um, I really didn't come across that I was aware of, uh, any issues because I was a girl. I, I just had to be good at what I did. That was the quality of the studio. It had nothing to do with anything else. You had to do your job well, or somebody else was going to do it instead. You know, if you got hired, it was because you were, you know, good at what you do. So I was lucky. Thank you so much for speaking with me. You're welcome, Hamish. Thank you for having me.